Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello to everybody. Thank you for the organizers for inviting me here. I am really happy to be here and to meet my colleagues to listen for the presentations to see you all. In my presentation, I will talk about the phenomenon of artistic work, or more precisely, the art of Lithuania's largest ghettos, Vilnius and Kaunas. The Vilnius ghetto was established on 6 September 1941 and liquidated on 23rd, 24th September 1943. The founding of the Kaunas ghetto, also called the Slobodke or Viljampole ghetto, after the city's district on the right bank of Neris River that was densely inhabited by Jews before the war, started on July 10, 1941. Jews were ordered to move in by August 15. In 1943, the Kaunas ghetto was converted into the concentration camp, and on 8 July 1944, its liquidation started. In this case, we're talking about the so-called stabilization period, which lasted from January 1942 to the autumn of 1943 when mass annihilation campaigns were temporarily halted and relatively few adults of working age remained in the ghettos. During the stabilization period in the Vilnius ghetto, the Writers and Artists Society was established and the theater was founded. On the theater's premises, art exhibitions were held and lectures about art were given along with those on more practical issues personal hygiene, diseases, etc. The ghetto's inhabitants had different opinions about the cultural activity. Some of them were indignant that all this fun was going on in the presence of death. Yet the majority wanted a distraction from dreary thoughts and eagerly attended performances and concerts which cannot be said about lectures. The reading statistics also reflect the general uh, mood. Among the most popular writers in the ghetto's library were Alexander Dumas, Jules Verne, Karl May, and Thomas Mainried, the authors of high suspense historical and adventure novels. The artistic life in the Kaunas ghetto was somewhat different. Speaking about art, it occupied a more prominent place uh, there than in Vilnius. Besides, its research is easier uh, as thanks to the Altestenrat member, Abraham Tori, quite a lot of artifacts have reached our days. Tori was a lawyer, a prominent figure of the Kona Jewish community. With the help of his assistant, Pnina Scheinzon, whom he later married, Tori accumulated documents and artifacts testifying to the ghetto's life and systematically kept a diary. Having put this material into five containers, he hid them away in several places. Three of these containers survived, and after the war were taken to Palestine through Poland and Bucharest. Today, the archive of Pnina and Avraham Tori is held in Yad Vashem. Bearing in mind the amount of attention given by society and historians to the fact, fate of Jews in the so-called uh, the bloodlands, according to the definition of the influential historian uh, Timothy Snyder, it is difficult to explain why the artistic work of the Vilnius and Kaunas ghetto inmates still remain, remain so marginalized. The only exceptions are the cases of two artists who survived the catastrophe. The talented Vilnius kid Samuel Bach, who chose to become an artist after the war, and Esther Lurier, who was imprisoned in the Viliampole ghetto. These two names are internationally renowned, and a separate wing dedicated to Samuel Bach's work was opened at the Vilna Grand State Jewish Museum in the autumn of 2018. One of the reasons not all wink us to see the big picture of the legacy of the artists imprisoned in Lithuanian ghettos is the fact 
that it is scattered in different memory institutions. Some works are held in Lithuania. The Tori collection, as has been mentioned, was transferred to Yad Vashem. Several works are found in the Ghetto Fighters House in Lohameha Ghetto Ot Kibbutz in Western Galilee. And some works belong to private collections in Israel and United States. Another reason of the lack of interest, at least in Lithuania, is the fact that none of the ghetto artists have become part of the national art discourse. The most prominent Jewish artists either moved to live abroad before the war, like Nehemia Arbit Blatas from Konas, who settled in New York in 1940, or retreated into the depths of the Soviet Union, like Rafael Hvoles from Vilnius, or were killed in the first days of the roundup of Jews, like Benzion Mihtom in Vilnius or Zale Bekeris in Konas. Among the early victims of the ghetto uh, killing campaigns, Uh, we are probably the most Lithuanian of the Jewish artists, Czernia Perzikovicute and Chaim Asmeris Feinsteiners, who both had been well integrated in the Konas art scene and the local artistic community. In the meantime, entries on the Vilnius ghetto artists as Lisa Deiches and Judel Mut, as well as the William Pole ghetto artists Peter Gadiel and Josef Schlesinger, are missing even in the Dictionary of Lithuanian Artists published quite recently. In other words, they are still non-existent in the history of Lithuanian art. This is reason enough for Vilma Gradinskaite, my colleague from uh, Vil Vilna Grand Jewish Museum, and myself to feel happy uh, that the invitation to this um, conference encouraged us to draw serious attention to the artistic heritage of the Lithuanian ghettos and rethink it as a whole. I'd like to mention also uh, an indirect contribution of our colleague Aisten Unkeite Rachunene, who several years ago published many, many interesting facts about Vilnius ghetto artists in her book about the legendary model of Vilnius produced by ghetto inmates. Among the artists who were put in ghettos and survived until the stabilization period in 1942, Jakob Scher, Rosa Sutskever Ushayeva, and Uma Olkenitska Lerer, Lerer were particularly active in Vilnius. All three were local artists well known in the Jewish uh, cultural community and already getting some renown outside this community. For example, on the eve of the war, Scher's solo exhibition was held in the Vilnius City Art Museum. Incidentally, the exhibits were still in the museum when the Nazis came. And because of the artist's Jewish signature, they fell under the spotlight of the Einsatzstabreichsleiter Rosenberg, were confiscated and probably destroyed or perhaps taken to Germany. In short, the further fate of Scher's works is unknown. All the three above-mentioned artists were dedicated fosterers of uh, Yiddish culture. Olkenitska worked in the Jewish Scientific Institute, Ivo, and headed the Institute's theater museum. Scher and Sutzkever belong to the milieu of the modernist group Jung Vilne. All three firmly believed in the leftist ideas and were influenced by social utopianism. Though it is only Sutzkever who did not avoid open social critique in her works. Olkenitska was more interested in graphic design, as you can see from those examples of her works. And Scher won fame as a painter of romantic views of old Vilnius. In the Konas ghetto, Peter Gadiel, Jakob Lipschitz, Esther Lurie, and Josef Schlesinger were particularly active. Among them, only Lipschitz was a native from Konas. He was an alumnus of the Konas Art School and from 1935 a member of the Lithuanian Artists' Union. 
He took part in the union's group exhibitions and in January 1940 held a solo exhibition at the union's offices. Lipschitz was killed and the other three survived. The survivors were arrivals from other countries who by a turn of fate chose to travel to Lithuania on the eve of the war and found themselves in the epicenter of the Holocaust mayhem. Vilma Gradinskaita will talk about Lipschitz, Esther Lurier, and Josef Schlesinger in her presentation, so I will shortly introduce only the works by Peter Gadiel. Gadiel, with his wife, René Zilverman, fled from their, from their native Germany, uh, where they were under the threat of repressions, both as Jews and communist sympathizers. Having stayed in Holland and England for some time, when the Battle of France was over in the late spring of 1940, they transferred uh, to René's relatives in Konas. Konas was occupied by Soviets in uh, June 1940. Having received the nickname of Fritz, Peter got involved in the activity of the local branch of Agitprop, an institution of communist propaganda. Relations with the communists and through them with other political activists together with, uh, uh, with his uh, extraordinary artistic skills ensured him an important position in the ghetto where he started and ran the so-called art workshop, thus saving the lives of some artistically gifted ghetto inmates who were unfit for heavy physical work. Peter and René survived, but their son, Ranan, who was born in the ghetto, was killed during the children's operation. According to Gadiel's biographers, he studied in Bauhaus. However, so far, I have not succeeded in finding his name in the Bauhaus students list. At any case, it is obvious that he worked in a similar manner as the Bauhaus alumni, knew the principles of constructivism, took interest in typography, and in general, was an excellent specialist in graphic design. Today, it is practically impossible to establish the authorship of the surviving constructivist style artifacts of the Konas ghetto, but it is not so important if it is the work of Gadiel himself or any other artist from his group, as there is little doubt that without Gadiel's organization and supervision, this information and di direction signs or the symbols of the ghetto various services would ever have been created. According to the contemporaries, the efforts to improve the ghetto's aesthetic environment had a positive psychological effect. They did not allow people to give in to despair and urge them to pull themselves together and stand proud. A unique common work of Gadiel and Tori was three-dimensional book documenting the ghetto's history, an unusual and impressive example of pop-up. Witnesses of the history of the Vilnius ghetto also confirm the importance of public art. In many memoirs, the decor of the sports ground is mentioned. Without knowing the context, it is difficult to understand the value of these primitive drawings. But as we imagine in what poverty and distress the Vilnius ghetto inmates lived, this modest attempt to improve their living conditions and decorate the environment acquires extraordinary meaning and significance. The same could be said about the logo of ghetto and the posters. Uh, those artifacts has particular meaning in this context. Everything was lacking in ghetto, food, clothes, and medical supplies. Artistic materials and tools were hardly a basic necessity. In Kaunas, it was somewhat simpler to obtain all that, as paints, paintbrushes, canvas, wood, and gypsum were needed for the ghetto's production activity. In Vilnius, according to the ghetto's chronicler, librarian Hermann Kruk, 
artistic materials were supplied to Jakob Scher, who painted portraits and romantic views of Vilnius Old Town on commission from the Nazis. In special cases, paints were provided to other artists as well. For example, to Rosa Sutzkever, uh, who created a design for memorable Abraham Sutzkever poem, So Tell It to an Orphan, calligraphically written on a separate sheet of high quality paper. The larger part of Sutzkever's surviving artistic heritage is portraits of the ghetto inmates. It was in line with the general intention of the ghetto's artist, artist to document the ghetto's life and inhabitants as consistently as possible. In richer periods, Sutzkever used paints, while in meager periods, she had to do with pencils or sepia. All the artworks, even the most modest one, found their viewer in the ghetto, and some of them became notable events in the community's life. For example, the portrait of Jakob Gerstein, drawn by Sutzkever, is described in detail by several of ghetto's chroniclers. Gerstein was a well-known music teacher, popular with parents and children alike, a composer and choir master. Thus, the fact of his death is mentioned in many of ghetto's diaries. At Gerstein's memorial service held on 4th October 1942 in the hall of the ghetto theater of a former Jewish bank, there were two portraits uh, of him created by Rosa Sutzkever. Former pupil of Gerstein, Isaac Rudashevsky, wrote in his diary, I quote, I am looking at the portrait of the deceased. He seems to be asleep, lulled to sleep by the melody, end of quote. Most probably, he had in mind the surviving sepia drawing. The artist wrote the date when she signed the drawing, 27 October 1942. It must be a mistake, October instead of September. Otherwise, which drawing was mentioned in Rudashevsky's diary? In any case, it is a visual document drawn from life and addressed to the absent contemporaries and the future generations, that means to us. Both then and now, the viewer is stunned by the likeness of the portrait and the portrait, the image and its, its model, what uh, art historian Hans Belting described and analyzed in his texts as likeness and presence. Both for the ghetto audience and for us, the distance that an artwork always provides is very important. In 1942 and before, there was so much of actual death around that it often no longer seemed unique or significant. An artwork, as if helped to realize the uniqueness of a depicted event and transferred the daily life to another level, enriching it with a deeper meaning and nobility. Certainly, you have five minutes uh, remaining. Yeah. Certainly, a visual art could not offer such intense moments as of consolation and joy as music, theater, of, or literature for people brutally torn off from their usual life and imprisoned in an alien environment, constantly undergoing spiritual and physical suffering, living in poverty, contempt, and constant fear of death. But it was also necessary and irreplaceable. Referring to Gerstein's portrait, we can once again underline the importance of the practical use of art in the conditions of ghetto life. The collection of posters for the ghetto's cultural events includes an announcement for Gerstein's Schlossim, the 30 days after burial memorial held in the ghetto theater on 27 October 1942. It is written in the skilled hand of a professional, obviously one of the ghetto's artists. It is an elegant calligraphic poster by its form sending a message about the respect of the evening's organizers for the deceased and his works. According to Rudashevsky, who read his school essay about Gerstein during this event, the hall was crammed with people. 
music, beautiful and meaningful words, and the feeling of togetherness along with such details as an artistic portrait of a deceased and a beautiful poster inviting to the event helped people to feel dignified in the dehumanizing reality of life. Gerstein's portrait survived in one of the ghetto's hiding places where it was discovered after the war and handed over to the newly created Jewish Museum of Vilnius together with other finds. The museum also had Sutzkever's pre-war painting, Homeless Boy, a moving image of a street child clearly showing that Sutzkever was deeply concerned about the wrongs suffered by the ill-fated. In the midst of Stalin's anti-Semitic campaign, when the Jewish Museum was closed in 1949, Gernstein's image found itself in the Revolution Museum of Lithuanian Soviet Socialist Republic, and the homeless boy was given over to the Lithuanian Art Museum. These works were reunited in a single collection after 1989, when the Vilna Gaon State Jewish Museum was founded in Vilnius. Gernstein's portrait is an excellent proof that an image created by the artist is a kind of memory pill bringing us closer to the reality behind that image that inspired its appearance. An image or a group of cognate images are easily turned into a personalized story or at least its rudiment. That is why images have the power to kindle the imagination which is indispensable in bringing the time of others closer to the present. Photographs are not enough for that purpose. Artworks born in the conditions of dehumanizing life are particularly powerful as we realize them as an attempt to withstand the pressure from the environment to retain personal dignity and identity. No less interesting is the informational layer contained in the images and allowing us to realize the circumstances of their creation, in this case, the reality of the Holocaust victims. In other words, art created in ghettos is not just art, and these works pertain not only to Jewish memory. It deserves to be more visible, more appreciated, and more deeply understood. All manifestations and forms of totalitarian domination, intimidation, restrictions, torture, prisons and labor camps, which the humanity faced in the 20th century, either exerted by the Nazis or the communists, radically changed the life of both the victims and witnesses to the terror. In other words, this art signals us about such situation, becomes their authentic proof, and encourages and helps us to rethink them. Do I have two minutes or? Well, generously speaking, you do. <laughs> <laughs> because I just wanted to add a few words yeah. about yes. Samuel Bach. Go ahead. Uh, this is the work by Lipschitz, and you will hear about him more detailed presentation by Wilma Gradenskater. Uh, Bach. Uh, his drawings reflect the double function of art. First of all, Bach's drawing testified to his attempts to escape from reality. It is a talented kid's imaginary world in which we recognize visions inspired by the books he read and impressions of his former peaceful and normal life. Interestingly, in those rare cases uh, when Samuel depicted the actual reality, the ghetto's boys in rags, a tattered old woman, a uh, round up in the ghetto or tenants of a cramped room, his individual style would change. The boy's hand as if could get constrained by the misery and the necessity to look for images yet undiscovered by other artists. An identical phenomenon related to the horror of reality, surpassing imagination and the inability to refer to any iconographic tradition has been noticed by other researchers of World War II, including Natalia Yevseyeva, who will present the case of Latvian artist Alexandra Beltsova. I'd like to end my presentation. No. Oh, yeah. uh, with the cityscape by Jakob Lipschitz that I showed at the beginning. 
the value of this artistically rather insignificant work is created by its documentarism and our knowledge of the circumstances of the context of its appearance. In other words, Holocaust artworks are no, not self-sufficient. They exist above all as a reference to historical reality, which we are unable either to fully comprehend or logically explain. The artifacts are a strong emotional link connecting us with that reality and not allowing it to drift away. Thank you for your patience and attention. Thank you very much to Gedri and Gimichute. Um, I will not ask the questions. I will let, let the audience ask just a, just a quick remark that I think the image of uh, a police armband with a design by a Jewish graphic design I think will be my, my takeaway forever from this presentation. It has a very vivid, uh, vividly plastered in my head now from now on. So please ask questions. Lūdzu var jautāt arī latviski. Es pārtūkošu, please. You, you can ask in, in Latvian or in Russian, and I will translate if need be. Please, go uh, ahead. You have mentioned, you have mentioned uh, the lack of interest, and uh, of course it came from just after the Holocaust, and I, I suppose till today also we're not very happy with it. Can you please uh, comment a little bit deeper into that? The reasons and the implications, and especially the situation today. Uh, the lack of interest to, uh, yeah. uh, to, to, the, to the art of yes. Lithuanian ghetto artists, yeah. yes. Uh, I mentioned the reasons in my presentation. Uh, the, one of the reasons is the really uh, scattered uh, heritage in, in which we can find only traveling around the world. Uh, for instance, uh, you mentioned this uh, really prominent exhibition in the uh, Deutsches Historisches Museum. And there were uh, many works of Kona's uh, ghetto inmates presented in this exhibition. But uh, in the official material uh, for the journalists, uh, there were no, uh, just one work by Lipschitz, the beaten brother. Yeah, and uh, it wasn't uh, mentioned uh, that it is a bit particular case. I mean, the Lithuanian ghettos, because they were uh, created later than the Polish for instance, and uh, uh, the conditions uh, for the artwork were particularly difficult. And uh, I haven't found any information about the Vilnius ghetto artists in the English written text, for instance, about uh, Rachel Sutskever, nothing, Uma Ulkenitsky, nothing, uh, Jakob Scher, he's just mentioned, but, but no word was said in English about him. And uh, uh, in Lithuania, they are quite unknown as well, because as, as I told, for instance, Vilnius case, Vilnius belonged to Poland, and it was thought that it's a part of the Polish heritage. And only now, the Lithuanian started to realize that it's uh, the local heritage, which should be analyzed and researched in Lithuania. And uh, the, with the Polish art, we have already the progress, but with Jewish art, not yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think can... that this conference is it's a good beginning. It's, it's a good start. And... Okay. Thank you. Another question? Uh... Yes. Yeah, so the ghettos in Lithuania were a source of music, which, and, and most famously the partisan song, which apparently was brought to Latvia. And I'm curious if there's anything you came across linking the visual artists with the people composing music, that they knew each other, that they collaborated, anything of that nature? You mean uh, in the ghetto? In the ghetto, yes. Uh, about the collaboration of different artists in the ghetto, we can read in the diaries by Abraham Tori and Herman Kruk. And, uh, uh, I think that the life in ghetto was quite similar uh, to the life outside the ghetto. Uh, people get their friends, their sympathies, and, and their enemies. And uh, the, the artists mainly collaborated with the uh, theater directors. They created the theater design, the stage design for the theater 
uh, of Vilnius ghetto, and yeah, of course, some personal relations among among them. But in Kaunas, for instance, as I uh, mentioned, uh, the most active artists were they were uh, how do you say aliens? They came to. Kaunas uh, on the eve of the war. So they have their restricted circle of communication of their friends, and only few of them were the locals, uh, which had the more wide relations with the local Jewish community. Thank you. Another question from the audience? Uh, yes, in the fifth row, or if I can count right. you for your paper. I would like to ask you if in uh, Vilna you have some research about the Abbe Kovner. I know he, he was a poet, but uh, he was uh, most important for, for Polish and I think that uh, to Lithuanian people. Uh, uh, Abbe Kovner, yes, yes uh, you know. Do you know works by Mendogas Kwiatkowskis? Excuse me? Mendogas Kwiatkowskis. No. He is our actual Minister of Culture, but uh, before this political uh, career, he was a uh, historian of the literature and uh, mm -hmm. he had a book on the Jewish About, poetry yes, uh, mm -hmm, uh, of mm -hmm. uh, the first half of the 20th century. Uh -huh. And he's uh, also a translator, he translates the Jewish poetry, uh, first of all, of Jung uh -huh, Vilna Group. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And yeah, yes, thank you, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, in, and if I may, in the end, I will ask one question, a follow-up question on the first one regarding the, the wider conversation. I am, of course, a lay person among you all. I'm not a researcher, so I will have a lay person's uh, question. Um, what do you think would help uh, bringing the, the art and lives of uh, Jewish artists to a wider conversation in Lithuania? People who are not researchers and not a specific and motivated audience, but to, to a, a bigger audience, to, to have this conversation out in the open and involving the uh, general public. What do you think would need to happen? The standard means, I mean, exhibitions, well-prepared, good, well-curated exhibitions, public lectures, and films. Great, thank you. And thank of you. Of course, we need the help of a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> I hope my whole colleagues in Lithuania heard that. So, Gietrinankevichuda, thank you very much. 